Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. America sees itself as a no-nonsense place. Its solid values are instilled in its people by rational leaders. But what happens when the people discover that their leaders have crazy beliefs? There is an appetite for hocus-pocus inside the highest places in the US government and the army and the intelligence services. Sometimes special forces soldiers try and give themselves superhuman powers. We had a master sergeant that could stop the heart of a goat. What, just by just looking by at it? Just by wanting the goat's heart to stop. This series has so far been about paranormal experiments conducted secretly inside military bases in America and brought to life inside shipping containers in Iraq. But this film is about how deadly the crazy ideas can get when they leak out into the everyday world. During the Cold War, the US Army secretly put half a dozen soldiers into this building. Their job for decades was to try and be psychic. We were foot soldiers, we were sort of psychic foot soldiers in the Cold War. We were the prostitutes of the intelligence community. Everybody wanted us under the cover of darkness. Came to us and said, can you give us some information here? We have nothing to go on. But no one wanted to deal with us in the light of day. No one. We were in condemned buildings. We went to property disposal to get our desks and our typewriters and, and stuff like that. We didn't exist. So how could we get supplies? But the nature of the job turned many of the secret psychic spies stir crazy. When you start looking at remote viewing, you're looking at producing information that violates space-time. Then your reality starts coming unglued. And if you're not real stable, you know, uh, there's no telling what you'll believe. And so the unit was closed down in 1995, and the psychic spies emerged into the strangest world of all, the private sector, where they became psychic spying teachers. This film tells the story of the terrible things that have happened since. Our story begins at a military psychic spying reunion convention at the Doubletree Hotel in Austin, Texas in 2002. Will you bend for me tonight? It says yes, okay? You'll find that on some of these it says no. If it says no, don't spend the evening trying to bend that spoon, it's not going to work. <laughs> okay. The spoon can be more hard-headed than you can. I thought I was here to tell a history story about Cold War paranormal experiments, but it turns out that this is no longer a history story. The psychic spies are back and fighting the war on terror. When President Bush said to, for all of his agents to think outside the box, what actually filtered down was that the government will not use these sources but the individual agents are now free to use them privately. Somewhere in this room are intelligence aides, so I don't know which ones they are, but I do know that they are here to recruit psychics who might be able to predict future Al-Qaeda attacks. This woman, Prudence Calabrese, is already working psychically for the FBI. Yeah, London, London, I think, is an area of high concern. It is um, certainly an area we've looked at, and we think that there, there's reason to be concerned if you live in London. So London basically is one of the... I, I'd say that there's a high probability of something occurring in London. What, when? What month? <laughs> <laughs> what time? Yeah, what time? 2.30 in the morning. Um, yeah, really, that's, it's just we're not at liberty to give any more information other than what we've given so far on this publicly schedule. Prudence wasn't in the military psychic unit, but she's invited to the reunion convention anyway. She's a leading civilian psychic from San Diego. 
A week after 9-11, the FBI phoned her. They wanted her prophecies, and she FedExed back London. But you're, you're sure you're right? We have never been wrong. We know the location, like what sector will say. Like a landmark? Yeah. Kind of Houses of Parliament type landmark? Um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, surely not, surely not fucking with the palace. I might tell you off camera. Prudence said she'd think about telling me what parts of London I should avoid during the next 18 months. Then, when I got back downstairs, this man took me urgently to one side. He said he was alarmed to see me talking to Prudence. He's a former military psychic called Paul Smith, and he says the FBI are nuts to want Prudence on board. When I asked why, he said for a start she once wore a Star Trek badge on national TV. Did they make a point of it? No. Mm -mm. It's just folks did notice it, though. Yeah. And is that taboo within the remote viewing world? No. I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, but if you think about it, if you are trying to promote something and make this credible, it would seem you'd be a little more cautious about the image you're trying to portray. And, you know, and of course, Star Trek, although I love Star Trek, I watch it, it is a fantasy. But I could tell there was something Paul Smith wasn't telling me, the real reason why he was so against prudence. Then he said this. And then became the infamous hale -Bopp Comet episode. You don't know about that? No. Oh. I don't know if I want to talk about this on camera. I have an interest of, you know, keeping harmony in the field, and, and she does have a, a bit of a checkered past in remote viewing. Paul Smith wouldn't say any more about the infamous hale -Bopp Comet episode. So once the convention was over, I drove to Prudence's house in the hope that she'd tell me. I had many questions, but my emails kept bouncing back, so I decided just to turn up. What was Prudence's checkered past? What terrible thing was about to happen in London? And how did a civilian like Prudence get mixed up in this military supernatural world? Hi, we're looking for Prudence. Prudence! It's John. We met in uh, Austin, Texas. I was filming you and you did oh, the remote right. view. Do you yeah, remember? I do remember, yeah. Can we come in? Well, right now is not really a good time because, um, can you come back tomorrow? Is it at all possible? Yeah, that's fine. Tomorrow morning. Yeah, tomorrow morning would be fine. Prudence has closed our shop. Just, just like that. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an enigma. We really don't know. Nobody really knows why. Um, there's speculation. Um, What's the speculation? Is this on camera? <laughs> well, yeah, only because when, when we were with Prudence in Austin, yes, she said, you know, she couldn't think of doing anything with her life except for remote right. viewing, and, yeah. and then suddenly her website's just vanished. Yes. I think she got spooked. I think something scared her. I think some group, some government group, you know, scared her some way. We don't really don't know. It is mysterious. It isn't is very it? strange. Yes. Psychic spying seems so benign. A funny story. Could this funny story be part of something darker? Is Prudence there? Okay. I know. I know you're out of the field. I just. Um... I just wish I could understand what happened. Okay. Right. Hang up on me. Prudence has a team of 14 remote viewers. None of them would talk to me. They all seemed scared. Whatever happened, there were 14 very freaked out people in Carlsbad, San Diego. I'm retired from the RV field. I am a private person and I wish to be left alone. Please leave me alone. So but, what, what changed but, since but like, Well, I wish I could tell you more, but I'm, I can't. Here's what Prue wanted me to, to tell you. She wanted me to tell you that there actually is a very big story. And she said that she will contact you first. The story will relate mm -hmm. to what you are most interested in.
While I waited for Prudence to contact me, I decided to piece together the story of how US intelligence first got mixed up in the psychic world. It turns out that like much in George W. Bush's administration, the answer lies in the Bush dynasty of the past. This story begins in this house in 1953. I was awakened, you know, very, very early in the morning. It was before dawn. And my, I was, my bedroom was in the back there and brought out here. And my mother uh, was sitting in a sofa, not this sofa, but one in this position. She was sitting right over here. And then there were two other, uh, you know, men here. And it was this very dim November, you know, pre-dawn. And you, uh, how old? I was nine. So I was kind of presented with this news, which basically was that, you know, your father has died. You know, he had an accident. And the accident was that he fell or jumped, you know, out of a window. These were these kind of terms that, you know, were just kind of presented to me. And I was completely stymied. Uh, excuse me, he did what? He fell or jumped? And, and, you know, as a kid, the, the, the issue was, well, you know, how do you fall out of a window? What do you mean? What, what, what does that look like, you know, fall out of a window? And why would he do that, you know? <laughs> why? I mean, what is this? What, what, what are you talking about? So at the age of nine, did you ask, what window did he fall out of? Yes. What was that answer? Well, to? it was a hotel window. Did you ask where? Well, we knew, I knew, uh, you know, the story was told from the beginning as having occurred in New York. For 21 years, all the Olsons had to go on was this vague, confusing explanation of a fall or a jump. And then, in 1974, the whole thing exploded. I shall resign the presidency effective at noon tomorrow. After Nixon resigned office, the government began a public house clearing of the CIA to root out abuses in the agency. The CIA was forced to release classified documents. One of them was so bizarre and lurid and unexpected, it enthralled the American people. The Rockefeller Commission's investigation of the CIA disclosed that the agency had conducted drug tests on unsuspecting participants, and one of them subsequently committed suicide. It was amazing, yeah, it was amazing. It was truly amazing. An, uh, an army scientist, that was the label, army scientist, was drugged in 1953 with LSD, by the CIA. By the CIA, reacted badly, taken for medical attention to New York, but unfortunately, you know, uh, jumped out the window. And then you go, drugs? LSD? What? <laughs> I mean, it was a, this amazing combination of enlightenment and befuddlement at the same time, both about, you know, why are drugs now involved in this, but also, is this my father? And at the same time, no, and it has to be my father. How many scientists were dr jumping out of windows in New York in 1953? Apparently, unbeknown to Olson, the CIA had dropped some LSD into his after-dinner liqueur. The CIA told Eric that his father's Quantro had been spiked with LSD by a CIA operative called Sidney Gottlieb during an office camping trip in this cabin in rural Maryland. Do you have any regrets about the project? Don't want to talk about it, really. Why not? I just don't want to talk about it. It's a, a right that you have and that I have. I've gone on to other parts of my life that's in my past, and that's where it's going to stay. Gottlieb was in charge of the program MK Ultra, the experimental program of the effect of hallucinogenic drugs on a captured intelligence officer, a captured Air Force flyer, somebody who, you know, they're all influenced by Manchurian candidate. Shoot Bobby Raymond. Through the forehead. Yes, ma'am. The film gave the CIA the idea that a soldier's mind could be controlled so he'd act against his own free will. <laughs> Sidney Gottlieb said he wanted to test LSD on different types of American to see if he could create a brainwashed assassin. It seems to me that responsibility goes up the chain of command because he was doing it for an intelligence purpose. Gottlieb was working under the orders of a close friend of the Bushes, once the Bush family lawyer, the director of the CIA, Alan Dulles. 
early on, Alan Dulles pretty much decided that the CIA really has to be authorized to do whatever it takes, you know, in any field. He gives a talk in, the, in, the, in early 53 where he says, mind warfare is the great battlefield of the Cold War, and we have to do whatever it takes to win this. Dulles was the first person in the American intelligence arena that believed that one of the roles of an intelligence service is to is not unlike a great university. You had to be a center that pulled in information from all quarters, including presumably the unconventional. Alan Dulles commanded his agents not only to spike people's drinks with LSD, but also to infiltrate seances so he could recruit clairvoyance to his mind warfare battlefield. This is how the remote viewing program began. It was funded with leftover MK Ultra money. The people who had been supporting us at the CIA were also involved in MK Ultra and other unsavory things. Sid Gottlieb was our very first administrator at the CIA. Charming, avuncular, kind of senior scientists of the Mengele School of Science. In the 1970s, the intelligence services realized that they didn't need to infiltrate seances because they had a great psychic in their midst, this man. The people who are acknowledged to be great, of course, are Joe McMoneagle. His name is always mentioned when it comes to remote viewing successes. What does the trigger mechanism on the Chinese nuclear weapon look like? Well, if you know where a Chinese nuclear weapon's sitting, then you can go out of body to that specific location and walk across the lab and look at the weapon sitting on the lab table and press your face down through the weapon casing and look at the weapon trigger mechanism, size it up, and come back and sit at a desk and draw it to scale. And that is a, something specifically that, that... That's something specifically that's that done. you did? Yeah. And did, did they act on it? Oh, yeah. It's, it's easily done. And did it prove to be uh, correct? I can't confirm or deny that. It had been a year since something frightening had made Prudence close down her business, and she still hadn't been in touch. The link between the psychics and the darker mind control programs made me think that maybe Prudence had got herself mixed up in a world where she was out of her depth. I looked back at the year-old tapes of the psychic spying reunion convention. For some strange reason, the organizers had banned the delegates from actually doing any psychic spying. Prudence had sensed that I wasn't entirely convinced that psychics fighting the war on terror was a good idea and she wanted to prove that it was. So we crept away to a hotel room so I could test her psychic skills. So I'm gonna write something down and keep it secret from you. But you need to do it now. Okay, okay, I'm gonna yeah. do it now. Do it, now. do it now. So I'm gonna to go, to, to, go to that table over there and do it. Yeah. Just, you know, don't show okay. me what you're gonna write down. I thought it might be an interesting opportunity to get one crazy branch of Alan Dulles's CIA to spy on another crazy branch of Alan Dulles's CIA. So I wrote, what happened to Frank Olsen when they spiked his drink with LSD in 1953? I put the piece of paper in my pocket and nobody saw what I had written. Focused on one of the people, he has like a headache or something, a lot of head pain. It doesn't stop hurting, like something feels swollen to him, like his head feels like it will explode. He's really uncomfortable, but he keeps walking like a zombie or something. It just feels really weird, like zombie like, like his head just hurts. Like someone stuck something in his head. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. Someone stuck something in his head. Yeah, but I know it doesn't make sense, but that's what it is. Someone stuck something in his head. It is very 
like dream like like a zombie like he couldn't think he was just had one Tripping. thing on his mind oh it's like a buzzy electric you know like buzzy electric buzzy electric it's like it's buzzy it's buzzy and it makes his head feel just huge it's buzzy he feels dreamy and spacey too, doesn't it? Totally yeah. dreamy and spacey, like a zombie. Yeah. Like totally like a zombie. Only like has bits and pieces of memory of this, like getting in his head. Why they put something in his head? And there's something really brown about him. I was extremely impressed. I hadn't mentioned his name. I hadn't mentioned LSD. I'd said nothing. Is it time for me to tell yeah, you? Right? Yeah. Olsen. Olsen? Great. He's the guy who who jumped out the window. Ooh. Isn't that in, the, in the American history that occurred? Uh, this yeah. was a CIA thing. Yeah, yeah it's a oh, CIA really? thing. I never heard of that. Yeah. 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 This is the CIA was like... No wonder he was, he was like a zombie and totally yeah. tripping out. Totally and he tripping was like... He didn't know. Yeah. And everything, every time I'd look through his eyes, everything was brown to me. It was like really freaky. He didn't thing, get a right? submarine underwater. He didn't get a plate of fresh clean dried tomatoes or anything like that. He got a dead guy and something that stuck in his head and made him a zombie. But I'm glad it yeah. worked. It always works. <laughs> it was an extremely impressive psychic vision of a bad LSD trip, but there was just one thing. The man who lives in this house was Frank Olsen's closest friend from the CIA days. Did you see him after he'd been given the LSD? Yes. We joked about it to some extent. What did he say? Well, he just said, you know, they're, they're trying to find out what kind of a guy I am, whether or not I'm, a, I'm a giving secrets away. So you were joking about it? Did, did he say... He joked about it because he didn't react to LSD. What, he didn't, he, he wasn't tripping at all? So who was right? Should we believe Prudence's psychic vision in which Frank did seem to be having a bad trip? Or should we believe Norman's story in which he didn't? Had Prudence somehow, weirdly, been remote viewing the myth of Frank Olsen and not the reality? So did he say, you'll never guess what they did, they put LSD in my drink? Yes, he told me. How did he say it? Was he laughing about it? Yeah. Like yeah. the crazy yeah. things these people are doing? I think it was more than that. He really thought that he, they were picking on him now because they thought he was the, the man who might give away the secrets. But there was a particular thing that they were worried he'd, that he'd oh, talk yeah. about. No, no question about it. Do you think I know what that particular specific thing was? Ah, that's, boy, you are a, an artist. That's a beautiful way of trying to get something from me that I don't want to talk about. The answer is, I don't want to say anything. If Norman was right and Frank didn't have a bad trip, then why did he jump out of a window a week later? What was the secret that Norman wouldn't tell me? Any uh, second thoughts this morning? No. No? I keep waiting for you to change your mind. These are the questions that have been haunting Frank's son, Eric, for the past 50 years. A few years ago, Eric had his father's body exhumed. The amazing part of this, I gotta tell you, I saw Daddy, you know, I saw him. He was very well preserved in the sense that the body seemed really intact, first of all. You could see that the legs had been broken. And the, the, the color of everything was a kind of brownish, kind of leathery color. The autopsy revealed that Frank Olsen had been hit on the head with something like the butt of a gun before he went out of the window. He certainly did not jump out the window, and God knows he didn't fall out. So what do you think did happen in that room? I think it's quite clear that he was thrown out the window. One day, Eric was looking at old home movies of his father. He found another reel that he hadn't seen before that his father had shot in the summer before his death. Eric never knew why his father had gone to Europe with some fellow CIA men, but now he does know. Didn't he come back from Europe looking very upset? Yeah, we talked about a week 
10 days after he came back. Now I asked him, I said, what happened to you, Frank? You you're, you're seem awfully upset. And he said, oh, I, you know, I don't want to go on further than that because it, it devolves, it devolves uh, certain things which I don't think I'd like to talk about. But Eric has had more luck with his father's old friend. Norman told Eric everything. That's my father right there. That was him. Yeah, that's him. In comparison with these other guys from the CIA, he just has an open face. I mean, he... Um, basically, this is a story about a guy who was a, you know, pretty... You know, had a kind of simple moral code, a kind of naive view of the world. It's got way beyond his... I mean, he wasn't fundamentally a military guy, and he certainly wasn't somebody who would be involved in terminal interrogations. And, and I think he just... He went through a, you know, basically a moral crisis, um, and it was, but he was in too deep, and they couldn't let him out. My father's colleague recently told me that this was what my father had gotten involved with in many trips to Germany, these interrogations in which people died. Uh, I mean, they, they were put, as, as my father's colleague put it, you know, they didn't care whether people came out of this or not. So they might survive, they might not, or they might be put to death, uh, you know, at the end. How, how were people dying when being interrogated? Well, because the, because the methods were so extreme. According to Norman Knoyer, Sidney Gottlieb and Alan Dulles were not just recruiting psychics and spiking people's drinks with LSD. There was a third exotic mind warfare endeavor, inventing new ways to torture Cold War detainees. If what I've been told is true, this is what Frank was involved in, but he had a crisis of conscience and was going to tell the press, so they pushed him out of the window. Now it's not a family story anymore. It's not about, you know, what happened to Eric's father. It's about what does this story about Eric's father show us about, you know, what was going on in the 50s and how that informs what's going on today. Think of how much could have been different if he was alive to tell any of this. The whole history of, of a lot of things would be different. And you can see a lot of that just in his face, actually. It's, it's fascinating. Because most of these others have very tight, closed faces. Uh, and he doesn't. I wondered, had Prudence gone to ground for similar reasons? Was she, like Frank Olsen, a naive foot soldier talking to the press, getting out of her depth? A year after Prudence closed down her business, she called. She said she was ready to tell me what had happened. She said there was a terrible story from her past that would explain everything. She said the story begins in 1995, before the world knew that the military psychic spies even existed. Prudence was living in Atlanta then, designing websites. She turned on the TV one night, and this was how it all began. A military man was on the screen. And did he say he was like a real-life Obi-Wan Kenobi? That's exactly the words he used. He said that he was a real-life Obi-Wan Kenobi. Working for the U.S. military. <laughs> Working for the U.S. military. <sighs> and until that moment, nobody, really, nobody knew that these people even existed. Yeah, before this time, um, they had been completely kept secret. The military man on TV revealed for the first time that the army had psychic spies and that they could shoot anywhere in space and time. He said they knew where terrorists were hiding and they knew that the Loch Ness Monster was actually a dinosaur's ghost. He was one of the leaders of the unit, according to his story, and he um, just didn't look like what you would expect. He looked like a normal person. He didn't look like he had super, super secret powers. So I what, thought, what did he look like? <laughs> He was short and scrawny, and he had this kind of crazy hairdo from the 70s and this mustache. And what was his name? I know his name was Ed Dames. I remembered why I, he was so excited about science fiction and thought, if I could learn how to do this just like he learned how in the military, then I could figure out all the things I need to know. Were, were people cross with you? Um, were people what? Cross. They're, they're, Did you say cross? Yeah. Irate? Angry? Mm. Oh, you bet. You bet. The defense intelligence is he mounted an investigation. Ed Dames. 
You know, if anybody should have put a gag in his mouth, that should have been the first one. Because he was, he clearly was out talking when he should have been listening. Very upsetting, incidentally. Why? Well, the, he had taken the same oath I took. Puffed his chest up and said, I was one of them. He wanted to be king. There's no doubt about it. You know? Yep, 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 yep. What was your motive for doing it? No, actually, I, I didn't have any motive. I didn't have any motive at all. Ed's rise to national celebrity was helped by the fact that interviewers sounded so beguiled by his military credentials and startled by his psychic predictions. Edward A. Dames, Major U.S. Army, retired now, is a decorated military intelligence officer, an original member of the U.S. Army prototype remote viewing training program, served as the training and operations officer for the Defense Intelligence Agency's Psychic Intelligence, or PSIIMT, collection unit. Military acronyms sound truly mesmerizing. Now, here's what, this is important, and before everybody goes to bed, listen to this. When you see a space shuttle, one of our space shuttles, being forced to come down and land because of a meteor shower, mm -hmm. that is the beginning of the end. That's the harbinger. Immediately after that will begin some drastic geophysical changes in the Earth, eventually resulting in a wobble and possibly an entire pole shift. Oh. There will be some who will live through this, Ed, or will no one live through it? No, the, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a couple of billion people. They're going to get crisp. Oh, the Art Bell Show. <laughs> coast to Coast Radio is the name of the show, and Art Bell had the biggest paranormal news radio show in the whole country, probably the world. They talk about Bigfoot sightings. And in the middle of this, <laughs> there was suddenly a, a major from the U.S. Army with you know, top-level clearance. Yeah, Ed Dames immediately became one of Art Bell's very favorite, very favorite interviewees of all time. I liked him the first time I did the show, and he helped me uh, business-wise to sell my products on his show. So I'm, I'm very grateful uh, for him to, for that, and it's a mutually beneficial relationship. It must have sounded to some listeners as if they were almost eavesdropping on a top-level meeting inside the Pentagon listening to Ed Dames and Art Bell. Yeah, it sounded real. And he would back it all up with all, all, everything that had been done in the military. So it made sense. I can't help thinking that if one of Ed's less colorful former military psychic colleagues had decided to spill the beans instead, all the terrible things that happened next might have been averted. Ed retired from the army and set up a psychic spying school for civilians. Until then, the psychic craziness had remained covert and controlled, a military secret that never left army bases. Now it was out in the private sector, and it was spreading uncontrolled across America. Let's say the vertical object on this particular thing. Ed was convinced that pregnant Martians were about to unleash a virus that would destroy all life on Earth. This kind of belief was attractive to swathes of the American public, especially because Ed was a military man and consequently trustworthy. If you wanted to learn remote viewing, you had to learn from Ed Dames. None of the other military guys were training at that time. Ed, and I tried to take training with him first, but he was book solid for two years. Everybody wanted to be a psychic spy. <laughs> and, uh, and so Courtney Brown started training in Atlanta, and I was in Atlanta, so it just was amazing to me. I was in the same city where you could get the only other training in remote viewing, and so I signed up right away. Courtney Brown was, I guess you'd call, basically a third generation remote viewer. Uh, he had learned from Ed Dames, who had learned from Ingo Swan. But you know, when you take a, a videotape and you record it, and, and then you copy it, and then you copy the copy, and then you copy the copy, you tend to get some additional things in, in, the, in the picture, right? I met Courtney Brown at a conference in Atlanta. He approached me 
and was uh, intensely interested in remote viewing and became one of my first commercial students in a week-long course, upon uh, which he formed his own institute and began teaching himself. Courtney Brown's credentials were impressive. He may not have been a top-level military spy like his mentor, Ed Dames, but he was a university lecturer in political science. He and Prudence became best friends and psychic partners, remote viewing aliens at their own training school called the Farsight Institute. I mean, we looked at so many alien things that it become, became a way of life at the Farsight Institute. We loved alien things. I still love alien things to this day. And no matter what we began to look at, we began to find aliens there. And who's to say that they aren't? In the autumn of 1996, Prudence and Courtney were sent this photograph of the Hale-Bopp comet. It was taken by an amateur astronomer friend of Prudence called Chuck Schrammack. There seemed to be a strange glitch in the photograph and Chuck thought it might be interesting for Prudence and Courtney to psychically spy the glitch. And so we um, remote viewed it and found that it was artificial, that it wasn't a double nucleus, it wasn't a mistake on his camera, it was an actual object and it was alien in origin and so we were so excited. Courtney got on our bill right away and started telling the world about this that we had seen. Well, uh, Professor, what the hell is that? I am willing to tell you. Tell me. Now, the information I'm going to give you is so far-reaching, so incredible, that you're going to be saying, how could this be? Now, I'm a professor. The people here that work with me, many of them, I have PhDs. This object is four times, approximately four times, the size of the planet Earth, and it's headed our way. It apparently, it has tunnels in it, and it is apparently moving in artificial means. It's under control. It's sending us a message. It's trying to get us a message right now, is that correct? That's exactly correct. Courtney Brown told Art Bell's listeners that the object in the tail of the Hale-Bopp comet was like the monolith from 2001. Art Bell's listeners had gone crazy for Ed Dames, but these ideas were even more entrancing for them. There are more of them coming. My lord. What? My lord. There are more of these coming? Apparently. This is not a fake War of the Worlds broadcast. And I'm not sure what it is right now. And so I want to caution you all that we're dealing with breaking news. And so please, uh, uh, please bear with us. I want to do this as responsibly as I can uh, here in a moment. This is not a fake War of the Worlds broadcast. Art, this one is real. Doctor, hold it right there. We'll be right back to you. Somehow I always felt I would be on hand for this. You're listening to the CBC Radio Network. Art Bell's website crashed with the volume of traffic. The number of listeners trying to log on so they could view Chuck Schrammack's photograph. It had only been a year since Ed Dames revealed the secrets of the military psychic spying unit, and now, as a result, Art Bell's 18 million listeners were preparing themselves for a full-on Martian attack. I guess this is what happens when the American people discover that their leaders are not rational. Irrationality sweeps through the land, and now all hell was about to break loose. In the days after Courtney Brown told Art Bell's listeners that the Hale-Bopp comet had an alien spaceship in its tail, Prudence and Courtney were inundated with emails. One stood out as being particularly strange. Just somebody, yeah, just somebody saying, could, could this companion raise us to the level above human? Could this, you know, take us where, where we want to go? And they got the standard, thank you for your interest in Farsight Institute. Here's our upcoming class schedule. <laughs> we're so excited, we don't know what to do, because we're about to re-enter the level above human. The Heaven's Gate cult in San Diego were Art Bell fans. They'd been wondering how to enter the level above human for years, but didn't know how to do it. As they listened to the Art Bell show that night, it all made sense to them. 
Now, if you would uh, hold your patch, maybe we can zoom in on the patch. Great. There we go. See, it says, Heaven's Gate Awaiting. And that's exactly what that means to us. We've been away, and now we're going back. On the night that the Hale-Bopp comet drew close enough to Earth to be seen with the naked eye, Prudence stood on a balcony of a Holiday Inn in Atlanta, and she saw that there was no spaceship in its tail. I was just staring at it. It was so beautiful. And I was just getting ready for the class, just wondering, you know, what was all that Hale-Bopp stuff about anyway? <laughs> trying to figure it out. We were trying to figure out where the companion object went, came into view, wasn't there. And then... Um, uh, one of the other teachers in this class came running up the stairs with the newspaper that had just come out, and it was huge headlines, full, pay, full pictures everywhere about the Heaven's Gate cult group in Rancho Santa Fe. And they showed pictures of the leader and pictures of all these people that had just killed themselves because they believed they were going to join the companion object to the comet. Thirty-nine people killed themselves so they could hitch a ride on Prudence and Courtney's hale Bop companion. It was awful. It was very sad. I just felt so terrible. All, those, all these people. It was very emotional. And... Um, you know, it's a helpless kind of feeling because, you know, you want to help somehow, but there's nothing you can do. <laughs> this is a stressful thing to talk about. I'm not really sure what to say. <laughs> I don't know what to ask. Yeah, it's, it was awful. <laughs> I mean, I guess, you know, you weren't to know that all the excitement, you know, all the excitement, you know, would lead to a mass suicide. It's... Yeah, there's, yeah, you'd think, well, you're a remote viewer, you should have figured that out ahead of time. I wondered if I was going to survive as a, a business entity after I heard court, and, and it's after you heard court Bell. Yeah, yeah. I, I wasn't sure what that would do to the future of remote viewing as a valid enterprise. Prudence's psychic spying business suffered quite a blow as a result of the mass suicides, but needs must, and post 9/11 she was back in business, predicting future terrorist attacks for the FBI. <laughs> and then I met her for the first time, and she indiscreetly told me, London. We're surely not, surely not Buckingham Palace. I might tell you off camera. Now, Prudence tells me, London Zoo is about to be hit by a dirty bomb so powerful it will knock over the nearby BT Tower. Prudence says she knows this because when she and her team psychically spied the impending dirty bomb, they could feel the pain of the elephants. The elephants were screaming in agony, Prudence says. It was a frightening thing to hear, and I continued to be frightened for a few months until I discovered the following information. And London Zoo's elephants pack their trunks to enjoy life in the leafy home counties. The three girls from the city have left their Regent's Park base for a new life in the countryside. How could the elephants be collateral damage in a London Zoo dirty bomb when the elephants, six months prior to Prudence's vision, had all been moved to Whipsnade? Prudence said the dirty bomb would definitely explode sometime before Christmas 2003, and frankly, it was a relief to discover it was all just psychic nonsense. Prudence is getting death threats from unknown military intelligence people, she says. This is why she's closed down her business. There have been phone calls calling her a mass murderer responsible for the 39 suicides and implying that she would die too if she carried on telling journalists like me the details of her war on terror psychic work. You know, threatening phone what? calls saying, you better stop what you're doing, click. People following you on the street, people running up and taking strange pictures of you when you're in a public place. That happens to you? That happens all the time, to this day. I can't prove that Prudence is really under attack, and I can't prove that the psychics are having a palpable impact on the war on terror. 
But when intelligence agents are sent out to talent spot clairvoyance, and when the last great war, the Cold War, relied heavily on psychic data, it is presumable that the psychics are having some impact on this war. Crazy psychic predictions influencing a crazy intelligence network and turning the American people crazy. Recent intelligence reports suggest that Al-Qaeda leaders have emphasized planning for attacks on apartment buildings, hotels, and other soft or lightly secured targets in the United States. Since 9-11, have I done any specific work? Uh, I can't confirm or deny that. And you couldn't confirm or deny which agency it, it may or may not have been? Okay. I am inclined to believe that Prudence is receiving death threats from intelligence people involved in classified paranormal pursuits. These supernatural endeavors may be funny to us, but they aren't funny to them. Sometimes it can be hard to give up a funny story, replace it with a story that's not fun, as Eric Olson has discovered to his cost. An LSD suicide story is considered strange and wonderful, a CIA murder story is not. Eric Olson is ready to charge at a news conference tomorrow that the story of the suicide plunge makes no sense and that his father was killed to silence him about the lethal activities he'd been involved in, programs codenamed MK Ultra. Dr. Olson may not have the whole story. The pity is that the governor's lid on his secrets remains so tight that we may never know the whole story. Don't go there. Don't go this there. This is Daniel Shore. Don't go there, Dan. <laughs> See, that's, that's what they want to do. Oh, we never know the whole story, you know? And there's so much comfort they take in that. Bullshit. No, it's bullshit. Yeah, yeah. The people have been so brainwashed by fiction, you know, the Tom Clancy kind of thing, that they think we know this stuff. We know the CIA does this, and so on. Actually, we know nothing of this, you know? There's no case of this. And this is, all this fictional stuff is like an immunization against reality and makes people think they know things that they don't know and it enables them to have a kind of superficial you know quasi sophistication and cynicism which is you know just a, a thin layer beyond which you know they're not cynical at all Frank Olson did not die because he was a Eric did give a press conference the next day saying his father was not an LSD suicide but a CIA murder victim but most of the journalists present reported it as a human interest story, focusing on Eric's healing process, and so the story was fun again. Throughout this series, we've looked at paranormal experiments conducted by the US military during the past three decades. Often the intentions behind them are honorable, and the experiments seem funny until they are implemented. Well, John Ronson is about to take part in a live web chat at channel4.com slash talk. And his book to accompany the series, The Men Who Stare at Goats, is available in shops now, priced $16.99. Coming up, Hugh Grant is late for a very important date, the first of many, in four weddings and a funeral. Good time, because... Um, can you come back tomorrow? Is it at all possible? Yeah, that's fine. Tomorrow morning. Yeah, tomorrow morning would be fine. Prudence has closed our shop. Just, just like that. Mm -hmm. It's a, it's an enigma. We really don't know. Nobody really knows why. Um, there's speculation. Um, What's the speculation? Is this on camera? <laughs> well, yeah, only because when, when we were with Prudence in Austin, yes. she said you know, she couldn't think of doing anything with her life except for remote right. viewing, and, yeah. and then suddenly her website's just vanished. Yes. I think she got spooked. I think something scared her. I think some group, some government group, you know, scared her some way. We don't, really don't know. It is mysterious, It isn't is very it? strange, yes. Psychic spying seems so benign, a funny story.
Could this funny story be part of something darker? Is Prudence there? Okay. I know. I know you're out of the field. I just, um, just wish I could understand what happened. Okay. Right. Hang up on me. Prudence has a team of 14 remote viewers. None of them would talk to me. They all seemed scared. Whatever happened, there were 14 very freaked out people in Carlsbad, San Diego. I'm retired from the RV field. I am a private person and I wish to be left alone. Please leave me alone. So but, what, what changed but, since but Austin? Like, well, I wish I could tell you more, but I'm, I can't. Here's what crew. Downstairs, this man took me urgently to one side. He said he was alarmed to see me talking to Prudence. He's a former military psychic called Paul Smith, and he says the FBI are nuts to want Prudence on board. When I asked why, he said for a start she once wore a Star Trek badge on national TV. Did they make a point of it? No. It's just folks did notice it, though. Yeah. And is that taboo within the remote viewing world? No. I mean, I didn't have a problem with it. Uh, but if you think about it, if you are trying to promote something and make this credible, it would seem you'd be a little more cautious about the image you're trying to portray. And, you know, and of course, Star Trek, although I love Star Trek, I watch it, it is a fantasy. But I could tell there was something Paul Smith wasn't telling me, the real reason why he was so against prudence. Then he said this. And then became the infamous hale -Bopp Comet episode. You don't know about that? No. Oh. I don't know if I want to talk about this on camera. You know, I have an interest of, you know, keeping harmony in the field, and, and she does have a, a bit of a checkered past in remote viewing. Paul Smith wouldn't say any more about the infamous hale Bob Comet episode, so once the convention was over, I drove to Prudence's house in the hope that she'd tell me. I had many questions, but my emails kept bouncing back, so I decided just to turn up. What was Prudence's checkered past? What terrible thing was about to happen in London? And how did a civilian like Prudence get mixed up in this military supernatural world? Hi, we're looking for Prudence. Prudence! Hi. It's John. We met in uh, Austin, Texas. I was filming you and you did oh, the remote right. view. Do you yeah, remember? I do remember, yeah. Can we come in? <laughs> well, right now it's not really a... ...are now free to use them privately. Somewhere in this room are intelligence aids, so I don't know which ones they are. But I do know that they are here to recruit psychics who might be able to predict future Al-Qaeda attacks. This woman, Prudence Calabrese, is already working psychically for the FBI. Yeah, London, London I think, is an area of high concern. It is um, certainly an area we've looked at, and we think that there, there's reason to be concerned if you live in London. So London basically is one of the... I, I'd say that there's a high probability of something occurring in London. What, when? What month? <laughs> <laughs> what time? Yeah, what time? 2.30 in the morning. Um, yeah, really, that's, it's just we're not at liberty to give any more information other than what we've given so far on this publicly schedule. Prudence wasn't in the military psychic unit, but she's invited to the reunion convention anyway. She's a leading civilian psychic from San Diego. <laughs> a week after 9-11, the FBI phoned her. They wanted her prophecies, and she FedExed back London. But you're, you're sure you're right? We have never been wrong. We know the location, like what sector will say. Like landmark? Yeah. Kind of houses of parliament type landmark. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> well, surely not. Surely not fucking with the palace. I might tell you off camera. <laughs> Prudence said she'd think about telling me what parts of London I should avoid during the next 18 months. Then, when I got back down, no one. We were in condemned buildings. We went to property disposal to get our desks and our typewriters and, and stuff like that. We didn't exist. So how could we get supplies? 
but the nature of the job turned many of the secret psychic spies stir crazy. When you start looking at remote viewing, you're looking at producing information that violates space-time. Then your reality starts coming unglued. And if you're not real stable, you know, uh, there's no telling what you'll believe. And so the unit was closed down in 1995, and the psychic spies emerged into the strangest world of all, the private sector, where they became psychic spying teachers. This film tells the story of the terrible things that have happened since. Our story begins at a military psychic spying reunion convention at the Doubletree Hotel in Austin, Texas in 2002. Will you bend for me tonight? It says yes, okay? You'll find that on some of these it says no. If it says no, don't spend the evening trying to bend that spoon. It's not going to work. <laughs> okay. The spoon can be more hard-headed than you can. I thought I was here to tell a history story about Cold War paranormal experiments, but it turns out that this is no longer a history story. The psychic spies are back and fighting the war on terror. When President Bush said to, for all of his agents to think outside the box, what actually filtered down was that the government will not use these sources, but the individual agents... Your Commander-in-Chief, the President of the United States. America sees itself as a no-nonsense place. Its solid values are instilled in its people by rational leaders. But what happens when the people discover that their leaders have crazy beliefs? There is an appetite for hocus-pocus inside the highest places in the US government and the army and the intelligence services. Sometimes special forces soldiers try and give themselves superhuman powers. We had a master sergeant that could stop the heart of a goat. What, just by just looking by at it? Just by wanting the goat's heart to stop. This series has so far been about paranormal experiments conducted secretly inside military bases in America and brought to life inside shipping containers in Iraq. But this film is about how deadly the crazy ideas can get when they leak out into the everyday world. During the Cold War, the US Army secretly put half a dozen soldiers into this building. Their job for decades was to try and be psychic. We were foot soldiers, we were sort of psychic foot soldiers in the Cold War. We were the prostitutes of the intelligence community. Everybody wanted us under the cover of darkness. Came to us and said, can you give us some information here? We have nothing to go on. But no one wanted to deal with us in the light of day. 